upon, she decided to break an alabaster box. She decided to wipe the pastor's feet. She decided to worship. Is there anybody in this house this morning who wants to go beyond the dining to the worship? You just want to say, Lord, I just want to give my love, pour my love on you. Now, this song is inspired by that incident. to play person to you this morning. I hear there is a master of the universe who set the sun, the moon up in the place I hear there is a healer going about doing good to all that he may meet. I've come to say how much I love him too. How so much dearly he means to me. I come to tell you, Lord, that beyond everything I feel, you are the love of my life. For you are God, most high. All I want is to worship you. Just wanna worship you. Oh, now listen. I hear there is a place that I can rest, that I can find in you and only you. <laughs> Here there is a reward for serving you And I've come to declare I want to do more and more I want to lay down my life before your throne And give my heart to you without I worship you. Somebody help me say, say, Lord, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. 
I worship you. You can lift your hands and say, I worship you. Say, I worship you. Lord, I worship, I worship you. That's all I want to do. I worship beyond the heating and the dancing. I worship you. When all is dark and lonely, I worship, I worship you. When I'm all by myself, I worship, I worship, I worship, I worship for you. this house this morning say all I want is just to worship you just to worship you all I want say you are God you are yes you are oh my God And all I want is to worship, is to worship you. You are God, you are God, most high. All I want is to worship you. So I stand. Heart. I stand, I stand in the heart of you, holy God, to our friend. Wonderful 
for comprehension like nothing ever seen who can follow your infinite wisdom who can follow the dance of your You are bigger than 
from the biggest, mighty above the mightiest. We are the war people say. You are good and you are good. You are good. us up this morning. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us strength. Thank you for giving us the ability to see, to speak, to walk, to move around, to talk, to smell, to breathe. Father, we do not take this for granted. We are grateful to you, O God. We, your sons, have come into your heart this morning to praise you. Father, let the words of our mouth let the meditations of our heart be acceptable unto you. And do for yours, do for us today what no man can do. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for the Lord. This morning we, we're going to go on with the word of God. But just before I preach, I want to, you know, this last week one of our dear brothers went to be with the Lord that suddenly and uh, abruptly uh, today is Sunday and on Thursday he passed on to glory we know him very well he has been with us since he started in our church many occasions when we started this church he used to come and help us with the music ministry and one of his favorite songs we sing I actually wanted I thought the prayer was singing this morning you know uh, we uh, was the king of kings the lord of lords God of God and Israel we worship you Uh, was sudden. Bible to the book of Luke chapter 15 to continue with our study on the pathways to recovery. Luke chapter 15. If you've been following this series, some of you have listened to the first three messages. I mean, or you've not listened to any of the rest of your MSA. You've not listened to any of the messages since I started this series. You've not listened to any of them. Just one person, just two. Hey, Pastor Pai, why is still there? Come and sit here now. So much is coming. Who else? whole, okay, whole row. I don't know how I'm going to summarize that for you. I'll suggest you get the CDs, please. Get the CDs. Uh, let's make sure that you get the CDs. And it will help you to get, I have learned a lot from this passage, reading it and studying it and preaching from it. And it's such a tremendous blessing in my life. I didn't know that God would speak to me from such a simple passage. Luke chapter 15, we should have had it on the screen now. Since I mentioned it. Verse 1. There was, he said, then all the task collectors and the, and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, 
if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. Verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Verse 7. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Verse 8. But what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a candle, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The synopsis of this, what I've been saying for the benefit of those who are hearing for the first time, is that there was this woman, I focus actually between verse 8 and verse 10. This woman was a single woman. This woman had 10 silver coins, which was supposed to, traditionally in those days, those silver coins were supposed to be used for her dowry. The woman was the one who gave the dowry and not the man, like we do today. Unfortunately, you know, the man, the woman is the one who, uh, who gave the, Even though I like it because I have a daughter, I always told people I'll be a millionaire. Once Miriam was born, I told them that I knew I will, I certainly will be a millionaire because, you know, I'll be waiting for the fat check. Wherever a guy comes from anywhere, I'm going to marry her. You know, they got to, they got to settle me well, well. You know, build a house and move into the house. I call it Miriam's mansion. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> so, this woman was getting ready for her wedding. She was getting ready for her marriage. And she had these ten coins. And the Bible says there were ten coins. Suddenly, she discovered that she had lost one coin. And her wedding, her marriage was supposed to be her future, was symbolic of her future, was symbolic of her destiny, where she was going to, where God had designed for her. It's the desire and the craving of every woman that someday she'll be married, someday she will have her own children. She was looking forward to that day. And then when that moment came, when family members had come from both sides of the family, from friends, from, you know, the brides and the bridegroom side, and just when they were gathered and they were ready for the ceremony, and everybody was dressed, you know, opulence and extravagance and then that moment came when she looked around for the one coin, for the ten coin she discovered that one coin was missing imagine the fear that gripped her imagine the surprise, the, the astonishment the embarrassment that came over her the fact that she had lost one coin and so the ceremony that everybody had been waiting for, the preparation and suddenly they realized that the wedding would not take place, suddenly they realized that the marriage would not take place, suddenly she realized that she would not be given over to that man, suddenly she realized that this man will not become her darling, personal, private, forever shall be husband. She was shocked. But this woman, thankfully, she did not give up. You know, this is symbolic. This story is symbolic of some of us. God has a destiny for each one of us. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. The Bible says that, Take to the righteous, it shall be well with you. That the expectation of the righteous cannot be cut off. Tell somebody, it shall be well with you. Say it aloud. It shall be well with you. God has a plan for each one of us. God has a definite plan. You are not an accident. You are not just a, stat a statistic somewhere, number you know, 329 million in America. No, God has a plan for you. So much has God has a plan for you that even the hair of your head are numbered. They are numbered. You are so significant, so important. You're not just one of the stars, one of the gal galaxies out there in the, in the cosmos. You are an individual who is the masterpiece of God's creation. And the Bible says that when God created man, he looked at him and saw that he was good, and he blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over all the earth. You are significant to God. Look at your friend and say, you are important. Even though I don't say that all the time, tell them, even though I don't say that all the time, even though I may not be happy telling you now that you are important. Some people are still not saying anything. They're looking at me. I'm not going to say it. I don't like him. I don't like her. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Tell somebody you are important. Even though I may not like you, you are important. Some people are saying, Kai, why did I sit beside her today? Oh, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> we are precious to God. So, and sometimes, some of us are living today in regret. 
Some of us are living today with this, with this nostalgia about what might have been but never became. We are looking, living today with the, the knowledge, many times very private, of the great possibilities that could have been our heritage. But uh, either consciously or unconsciously, we lost a moment in time when we would have ridden the crest of destiny and move on to our destiny. The God we serve is a God not just of second chances, but of multiple chances. It's a God who has loved you with an everlasting love and whose purpose is that even when you fall, he will pick you up. Even when you are lost somewhere in the days that like the one sheep was lost, he will leave the 99 and come looking for you. So the plan and the purpose of God is to restore you to the destiny that he designed for you. It's to restore you back to the past, to glory that he intended for you before the foundation of the world. I think somebody should say amen there, or glory to God. That's the plan of God for us. So the Bible says that this woman did not give up hope. And I want to say to you, don't give up hope. Things might appear so dark and bleak, but the God you serve is a God of a greater tomorrow. Your future is better than your past. Whatever is ahead of you is greater than the experiences of yesterday. And the things that you will acquire in the future are far greater than the things that you have lost. Because the God we serve is a God of restoration. He said the years that the canker worm, the locust, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar has eaten, that he can restore to you by the snap of a finger. The locust, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, and the, and the palmer worm, they are, the, they are in various stages of development. So in the various stages of your life, at age 7 you lost something. At age 25 you lost something. At age 29, you lost something. At age 35, you lost something. At age 40, you lost something. God can restore everything in the various stages of your life. He can. So this woman, the Bible said that she did not give up. And I want to say to you today, don't give up. Because it is not over until God says it is over. It is not over until the fat woman sings. That's how they say in America, man. That's how we say it. Until the fat lady sings, it ain't over yet. So it's not over for you until God says it is and as far as God is concerned, it will not be over until his kingdom has come and his will is done in your life on earth as it is done in heaven. Come on, I want somebody to be excited this morning. Be excited. Rejoice and be glad for the Lord your God will do great things. He 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 will do great things. The woman set out to do something. There are five things that this woman did. And I've been dealing with the first two, and I will hope that we'll have time. There are four things she did for. The first thing she did, tell, talk to me, church. What was the first thing she did? She turned on the lamp. 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 You want to ask yourself a question. How could a woman be preparing to marry and the house is dark? How could she be preparing for her wedding day and she cannot see the mirror? When women carry mirrors all over the place, check their backs now, you'll see four mirrors. They carry mirrors everywhere. The bathroom, they have mirrors. In church, they have mirrors. In the hospital, they have mirrors. You know? Call a woman and she wants to do something. Even when they're about to die, they want to... You know? She turned on the lamp because she was living in darkness. Bible says that the habitations of the dark places of this world are full of cruelty. The world lies in darkness. The world works in darkness. The world operates in darkness. That's why in the club and in the lounges there is so much to turn on the lamp. Look at somebody and say, turn on the lamp. The lamp is the word of God. Your word is a lamp unto my path, unto my feet, and a light unto my path. She turned on the lamp so that she can understand the word of God. So that she can find out what God says about her. So that she can develop self-awareness. Number two, she did what? Where is my broom now? Uncle, where is it? Can't get it. Number two, I was swimming. Bring all my broom, including my apron. The woman set about sweeping the house. She started sweeping the house. Now that tells us something about this lady. You wonder whether she was ready for marriage. Because if on the eve of her wedding, the house is still dirty, this woman was not ready for wedding. There are some of us today. You have been praying, God, give me a husband, God, give me a husband. God is saying you are not ready. If I give you the husband, you will abuse him. You don't know how to take care of yourself. You are looking to add one person. 
to the one that you cannot take care of. If you cannot take care of the little, how do you expect God to give you more? You can't take care of yourself. You're asking God to give you a husband. Let me tell you, women, you are very, very important. Women are very, very... The world is not complete without a woman. A man is not complete without a woman. A man who does not have a woman in his life is not just an incomplete man. He's a half man. It's a man who does not know his left from his right. Every now and again, he wears his trousers on his head. Every now and again, he is through his nose because he does not have a woman in his life. It's a man who goes to bed at night and the TV is his best friend. Wakes up at night and watches pornography because he does not have a woman in his life. God says it is not good for a man to be. Therefore, he gave him a woman. If God could give if God could satisfy a man, he would not have made a woman. God is complete, yet he could not perfect a man without a woman. A woman is important. That's why every woman should see herself as priceless. Every woman should see herself as a queen. Every woman should see herself as dignifying. Every woman should see herself as, as precious. Every woman should see herself as... <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So you must package yourself properly. Because if you do not package yourself properly, you become a liability to the man. You become a liability to the world. You become a liability in the home. You become a dysfunctional, broken, disjointed, discombobulated, liability. How could you be getting ready for your wedding and your house is not clean? Because the Bible said that she swept the house. If the house was clean, would she have been sweeping it? No. She swept the house. Not just sweeping the house. Not sweeping the house. And some of you need to clean your life. There's too much junk in your house. In the house of your life, there's too much junk. Because that house was symbolic of her life. The Bible says, go with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says, what do you not know that your body is the house of God? Verse 9, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God and you are not your own. Verse 20. He said you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in this your body. In your body. And in your spirit which are God's. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. That means exercise so that God can be glorified in your body. Because some sicknesses are caused by lack of that means eat the right kind of food. Don't eat the junk that your appetite is craving for. Simply because you want to satisfy yourself. Because you don't belong to you. You belong to God. Your body is the temple of God. That house that this woman was cleaning was symbolic of the temple of God. She was cleaning the house of God. She was cleaning the house of God. Many of us need to clean our lives. We need to clean the house of God. Okay? We need to clean the house of God. I think Isaiah chapter 6 or so. Six, six, six. It says that, it says, God is in the heavens above. He said, what can you prepare for him? He said, he will not occupy any place except occupy your life. Occupy you as a person. And there are many of you, your houses, your house, when I say your house, I'm talking about the house of your body. It's such, it's such an anathema to God. It's such an appalling place for God to come and stay in. He wants to come into your house and he sees, you know, Cobwebs all over the place. It says junk all over the place. Look at somebody and say, clean up this house. Clean up this house. Clean up your house. Clean up your house. Now, let's look at a very interesting story. You see, when God asks you to clean up your house, it is because he wants to take you to another level. And this message, like I said, is pathway to recovery. God wants to take us to another dimension. He wants to take us to another level. But he wants us to start with first things first. They call that fundamentals. Starting with the fundamental. Look at Joshua chapter 3. Very interesting story in chapter 3 of the book of Joshua. 
Joshua, the children of Israel had left Egypt. The children of Israel had subdued Pharaoh and bankrupt Egypt. The children of Israel had gone through the wilderness 40 years. The children of Israel, God by his spirit has instituted the principle of the Passover. God had taken them through 40 gruesome years in the wilderness. He kept them, showed them miracles, took them, took them across the Red Sea, took them across River Jordan. And this moment, Moses had died and Joshua was to lead them to another level, to that place of promise that he had, he had, he had, he had pronounced over 400 years, over 500 years earlier. He was to take them there as they got to the border, the very edge of entering into the place of their inheritance. Many of you today are the edge of entering into another level. You are the edge of moving into a totally new dimension. And I want to say to you today what God is going to do in your life. Yes, I've not heard. Men have not imagined it. Neither has it entered the heart of man. What God will do for you. Look at somebody and say, wait for me tomorrow. You will see a different person. You will see a different person. You will see a different person. Oh, you think this is all about me? Wait! You will see me on Mount Zion, mounting up on wings as eagles, and accomplishing great things for God. Joshua chapter 3, on the eve of what God was about to do to their lives, look at what Joshua told them. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Look at it. Joshua told them, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Look at it from there. Give me the New Living Translation. Sanctify yourself. The word sanctify means to consecrate, to set apart, to dedicate. Let's look at it. Let's read it together. Everybody from the New Living Translation. Everybody please. Look at the screen. One to go. It says purify yourselves. Purify yourselves because tomorrow the Lord will do great things. Now, Purify yourself because some of you are living with so much junk in your life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You have no clue who you are. You do not realize that you are precious to God. You do not realize that there is something about your life. I'd like us to read that passage together. First. First, no, let me give it in the, in the King James. I like it in the King James. I've always recited in the King James. He said, for you are a chosen generation. You are a royal police priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's own special. That's who you are. You are not Mr. Nobody. You are not Miss Nobody. You are special to God. God has chosen you and set you apart for himself. And he wants you to exhibit his glory. He wants you to show forth his purpose. He wants you to magnify his name. So Joshua told the people, purify yourselves. Clean up your house. Clean up your house. Clean it up. All those things in your life that are not consistent with the word of God, begin to deal with them. Because remember I told you this yes, uh, last Sunday, the word of God is not intended to medicate your feelings. No, oh, no, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> we hurt your feelings, but we made you healthy. The word of God is not intended to make you happy. The word of God is intended to make you healthy. If you went to the hospital today and the doctor looked at you and said, well, I see something, does an chest x-ray, and it says, well, I see some areas of, you know, opacification on your chest. It looks like you have, have you been to, uh, did you have somebody who was coughing around you? He said, yes. Uh, when you sleep at night, do you have night sweat? You say, yes. In the evening, do you have temperature? You said, yes. Have you been feeling weak? He said, yeah. He said, it looks like you have tobacco. He said, oh, no, you hurt my feelings. No. The doctor is not supposed to make you happy. He's supposed to make you healthy. So you don't go around throwing stones at the doctor. How can you say I have to wear clothes? You will die. You don't get treatment. You will die. It's trying to help you. It's trying to make a proper diagnosis so that you can be healthy. You will die. You don't get treatment. Okay? So the word of God is not intended to medicate your feelings. Oh, you hurt my feelings. Hey, I don't like that pastor. Hey, he says things that make me uncomfortable. If it makes you uncomfortable, it means that the pastor is preaching the right thing. You need to get treatment. You need to get treated. You need to get proper attention, medical attention. So, God says, purify yourself. Sanctify yourself. Joshua, Genesis chapter 35. Let's look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 to 4. Very interesting passage. Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 
Did I say 13? What did I say? Chapter 35, 44. He saw um, Jacob had come close to a new, a new vista in his life, a new, a new dimension. He was just about to enter that level where he will be moving on with supersonic speed. Look at what he told his, his children, his people. He said, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar, make an altar when, make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said, to his household and to all who were with him. What did he say to them? Let's read the next sentence together. Put away the foreign gods that are among you and do what? And change your change your garments. Some of you do not realize that what you wear tells people about who you are. There's a passage in Genesis where Judah when visiting a city and he saw a woman standing by the roadside from her dress from the way she looked he said this one now has no many of you need to change your garments change your garments take off some of this on them I know you want to be like Hollywood eh? because when you watch some of those shows those those um, awards, some of them go to those awards without undies. Some of the women, you say, eh? Oh, okay, oh, I'm telling you. Some of the women go to those, on, those awards without undies. And they'll be interviewing them the following day. How did that dress feel on you? And many of you will be ridiculous and giggling. <laughs> what are you giggling? Somebody's, somebody's riding to hell without brakes. And you're giggling. When you see those things, say the blood of Jesus and change the channel. Say, purify yourself. Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Remember I told you, you are a chosen nation. You are a royal priesthood. So idolatry is foreign to who you are. And what is idolatry? Idolatry is simply anything that you worship more than God. Anything you worship. Let's go back to that passage. First Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go back and look at that passage. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I feel good this morning. I feel good. I feel good. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. 9, 9, 9, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be neither nor idolatry, idolatry idol worship for some of you fast food is an idol fast food you must eat maki, maki whatever they call it it's an idol idolatry for some of you not saving no, you must spend, spending is an idol you must spend whether there's a sales or not, you create your own sales when you get to basis. Spending is an idol. Some of you, pornography is an idol. It is an idol. So you must watch pornography. Because what's an idol? An idol is anything you worship. Anything that has taken possession of you. Just the same way the Spirit of the Lord comes over us and we worship God. It's the same way the spirit of pornography comes over you and you worship pornography. So, Jacob said, put these things away because God is about to do great things in your life. Tell somebody, put these things away. Put this in. Tell, tell somebody, don't look at me. Tell somebody, put it away. Put it away. Some people lying is an idol. They must lie. If they don't lie, they are never happy. I'm telling you. You ask them, where are you coming from? Eh, what are you stammering? You know where you are coming from. Some people making money at all costs by any means is an idol. See, money is good because money answered all. But you're not going to make money by all means, by any means, you know, you, 
you step on people you want to make money no it is God who gives you the power to make it's an idol Jacob said put them away 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 put away adult, adult trust behavior put away homosexuality and sodomites sodomy all these pedophiles you hear around you hear about when, some of them when they start confessing they will say uh, it's an addiction there was a guy who used to be in congress I don't want to tell you his name he used to be in congress and he was actually the guy who had passed a bill and was advocating for young people and yet he was abusing young children when eventually he was caught he said oh it's an addiction he checked into a rehabilitation a rehab clinic Anything that controls your life that is not biblical, that's not spiritual, it is what? It's an idol. It's an idol. And many of you need to burn those idols. Because I'm sure some of you are thinking that an idol is that uh, this thing that they carve and is uh, staying by the corner of the house. My uncle used to have one of them. One day I entered his bedroom and I saw them by the side of the door. And I was shocked. Then when he became a Christian, he destroyed them. And he became a believer. He destroyed them. You need to destroy those idols. You need to destroy them. Search your heart. Nobody can tell you the idol in your life. You know the idol in your life. Anything that controls you, anything that controls your appetite, that possesses you and makes you behave like a zombie. Go and kill Joe Roger, go and steal Joe Roger, go and do Joe Roger. It's an idol. It needs to be destroyed. So Jacob told them, let us destroy those idols. Okay, let's destroy those idols. Let me show you this passage. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Joshua 24, 15. Please, I like that camera moved away a little bit so that I can see the time. I can't see the time. Joshua 24, 15. What does it say? It says, Choose ye this day. If it seems good to you, choose for yourself this day whom you will. Whether the gods which your father served, the gods which you served before you became a Christian, whether you want to continue serving those gods or you want to serve the Lord, what do you want to serve? You want to serve the Lord God of Israel? The God who has redeemed you, the one who went to the cross and died for you. Do you want to serve him or you want to be serving all those petty idols? Say, for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. May God help you to serve the Lord in the name of Jesus. Come on, may God help you to serve the Lord in the name of Jesus. So this woman, she did a couple of things. Okay? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 to 16. 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. What does it say? It says, you should be holy as I am holy. For without holiness, no man shall see. It said, be ye holy as you. I said, 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Conduct says conversation, your lifestyle. Verse 16, it says, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, I think, it says that, pursue peace and holiness with all men, without which no man shall see God. It did not say, coming to church. No, it's not. Look at 13. It didn't say coming to church. Without coming to church, no man shall see God. It said, no. It said peace and holiness. And I'm glad it says peace and holiness because there are some of you here who do not talk to some person in your family or somebody in the church and you say, well, you know, I've decided to keep my distance and let them keep their distance. And when you see them coming, your heart skips a beat and you change direction during a worship like this. I do worship you highly. I worship you highly, highly to worship you. And you turn around and you see the person, the person is worshiping, worshiping God. And you get angry. Without peace, no man shall see God. So you pursue peace. Even when you are, even when you are right and they are wrong, go and apologize if that will bring peace. Because there is a reward for the peacemakers. Blessed are they, for they shall see God. And there are some of you, when you hear there's trouble, you show up with a can of water and a can of gas on the other hand. Can of water in one hand, can of gas on the other hand, gasoline. What happened? Eh? What? Eh? What? 
happened? Hey, you pour water. Hey, fight, fight, fight. You pour. By the time you leave them, everybody is fighting. When you see those kind of people, run away from them. They give you unholy advice. Eh? Hey, you took that from him? Ah! If it is me, ah! Hey, he, ah! Hey. You change your voice. <laughs> Come a scorpion. May God help us in Jesus' name. We don't have too much time, and I want to I want to zone this thing quickly to the issue that you know people were asking this question last week. What about sexual sin? What about you know? I spoke about that. Let's go back to it. That same First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen. Let's look at it. Verse, no, not verse nineteen. Verse nine. First Corinthians six nine. I told you, the Bible says that fornication, adultery, is not good. You know, we talked about that a little bit last week, and homosexuality and sodomy and all that stuff and somebody was asking you know what about masturbation and all that because the bible said that every sin you commit is outside your body but that sin the sin of sexual i put them under one category and i call them sexual perversion it says it's against your own body what it does is that gradually it's, it, 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 it deadens your heart 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 after a while, you lose consciousness of right or wrong. In fact, studies have shown that almost every despot, every, every leader who is an autocrat, somebody used that word this morning, <laughs> dictators, tyrants, all of them, almost all of them, studies have shown, all of them are involved in one sexual perversion sin or the other. When they invaded the house of Mobutu, Seso, when they threw him out of power, what did they find? A huge pile of pornographic materials. When Usei and Kusei, Saddam Hussein's sons, were killed, what did they find? A pack, a stack of condoms. It's, it's common. Tyrants, Hitler, when you check almost all of them, there's always sexual perversion in their life. Because sexual perversion, it poisons your soul, poisons your heart, and gradually it moves you to a place where you are never sensitive to the things of the spirit. I'm telling you. And that's why you can see a pastor is preaching well. The kind of thing he's doing, what he does is it poisons his heart. So that's why he can do that and come to the pulpit and still preach without a prick of conscience. It makes you insensitive to the spirit of the Lord. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a disease called leprosy. Leprosy, part of the thing with leprosy is that your nerves are destroyed. And because the nerves are destroyed, the nerve sensation for temperature, for instance, is destroyed. The man can put his foot on burning fire and not feel it, on hot coal and not feel it. Because the sensation for temperature has been destroyed. So what this happens is that Sexual perversion destroys your sensitivity to the promptings of the Spirit of the Lord. And you get to a place where you are, you are, you are. I heard a story of two guys, a guy and a girl. I heard this thing happen in Benin, you know, many years ago. I heard there were Christians and they, um, the, there were leaders, some of the leaders, and they were supposed to have a meeting in a particular house. They had gone in early to that house and they were sleeping with themselves. When they heard the brethren or the footsteps and the voice of other brethren coming, they quickly got up and knelt down and started worshiping God. We worship you, I live. But both of them died on the spot. Or somebody will say, but well, pastor, I've been doing it for a while and you know, God has not done anything. Yeah, God will not do anything. Follow me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Let's go. Are you happy you came to church today? Uh -huh. I know you had to say something so that would be good. Okay, look at verse 11. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11 and 12. He said, Because sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set to do evil. The next one, he said, Beds. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet 
I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God and who fear before him. The next one says that it shall not be well with the sinner. It shall not be well. So yeah, you've been doing it, you've been doing it, nothing has happened. <laughs> A day is coming when something will happen. And you don't want that day to come. You don't want that day to come. And some of you, you lose your inheritance. You lose the greater dimensions of God's blessing for your life. Go ask Esau. Esau would have been a great man. But because of the Bible says sensual perversion, he was a profane person. Some of you don't do it, but the way you say it, say it from the wickedness of your heart. You use all the M words and the F words and the most derogatory words. And when you speak, sometimes people have to turn around and say, is this man a Christian? I know some women who say, if you hear my husband cursing, and some men will say, if you hear my wife cursing, why should you be like that? So the question has been asked, what do we do? Now, I, and I told you this, listen, there's nothing wrong with sleeping with the woman you intended to marry. But get this clearly, because some people went away last week with a wrong understanding. Some people say, oh, pastor said that. Yeah, I told you. I told you. Yeah. No. And I like this illustration somebody gave me after service. You see, I can go to Iloluji today and tell everybody there's nothing wrong with coming to America. Please, come to America. Come to America. But how do you get to America without a visa? Does that make sense? It's a good idea to come to America. But if you don't have a visa, you come to America. In fact, now the airlines will not even carry you because they used to find them heavily. They won't carry you without a visa. You come to America when you have a visa. If you sneak your way through and you, you cling to, the, to the, um, the tires of the plane, you will die in midair. You will die. I was in England when a guy entered the thing like that from India. You know, by the time he got to London, he had frozen to death. Frozen to death. There was a young boy in Benin who tried it anyway. He entered the thing. I, I forgot what airline. He got to Lagos. <laughs> he survived it though. But that was a short flight. And the temperature in Nigeria is comfortable, right? Uh, they arrested him. I said they should keep an eye on that boy. He would be a genius. I'm serious. A four, I think 14 year old, 13 year old. A boy who could wake up and think of entering the airport and clinging to this thing and get to Lagos. They ask him, Where are you going? He says, He's going to America. <laughs> Bible says, let's go back to that passage, please. First Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go back to that passage. First Corinthians chapter 7. Let's look at it, verse 8 and 9. First Corinthians 7, 8 and 9. Can we have it on the screen? First Corinthians 7, 8 and 9. He said, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain even as I am. Now, Paul, I don't have time to teach on this, but someday I'll, I'll have the time. Paul was saying that this is his own preference that. If you are single, do not marry. That was what Paul was saying. But see, Paul was saying that this is my suggestion. It's not an authoritative instruction from the Lord. Because he says, you know, he said, but, he said, but if you cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. Let them marry. He said, because it is better to marry than to burn with passion. One translation actually says, I think the New Living Translation, he said, it is better to marry than, than to burn with sexual passion, desire. One other translation says it's better to marry than to burn with lust. Another one, the, living, the, the revised standard one is the one I actually like. It says it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Sexual desire is a passion. When it catches you, it catches you. There are four satiety centers in the brain. Four centers of satisfaction in the brain. One is the center for thirst. Another one is the center for food. Another one is the center for shelter. Another one is the center for sex. Sex drive. 
That's why people rape and all that stuff. Because they've been serving the idol of sex. So they just go out. Joro, jara, joro. So the Bible says it is better to marry. So the condition for... Hey, hey, grab that young man. Tell him to come and sit down. I want every young man in the... Bring all the young men in the lobby. Let them come and hear me. The precondition for sleeping with a girl, this girl you love, the precondition for sleeping with her is that you marry. Marry first. Get the visa first before you know her. That's a biblical word for sex, before you have sex with her. So all of you, these young kids, you are 17. Oh, I love him. He sends you a text. You are both of you on Twitter. At night, instead of sleeping, you are, on tw- you are waking up on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Send. 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 The Bible says it is better to marry than to burn, to be overrun by sexual passion. To marry. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible... Who said it? Is it me? The Bible says, marry, marry. There's nothing wrong with getting married. Hebrews 13, 4. It said, marriage is honorable and the bed on the farm. Marriage is honorable. God created marriage. The concept of marriage, the idea of sex was not man's invention. It was created by God and it is good. It's good within the confines of marriage. Not outside the confines of marriage. Oh, some of you say, but pastor, the passion is so strong. I agree, the passion is strong. But God will not ask you to do something that you cannot do. You can wait. You can wait. Even if you have to take a cold bath or go jogging, do it. I plead the blood of Jesus. I will wait. I plead the blood of Jesus. I will wait. I plead the blood of Jesus. I will wait. I plead the blood of Jesus. I will wait. Because you can wait. I can do all things through him that strengthens me. There's a lady who is a popular, you know, some of you know her song, Rebecca St. James. Have you heard of Rebecca St. James? Pretty Caucasian, you know, girl. She said, she said it is important to wait. She started a movement. Wait. Wait before marriage. There's, there's, there's joy in waiting. But, uh, let me show you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to take another five minutes. Let's go to Genesis chapter 34. Some of you say, well, but God did not say I should wait. He says you should wait. Oh. Look at somebody and say, wait. Tell everybody beside you. Tell them, wait. I know some of them are married, but tell them, wait. Uncle, wait. Wait. Lady, one of these Hollywood girls, ladies, she said that I think she's been married twice or something. That, you know, after her second divorce, this is what she said. She said that if I'm going to marry another man, I will tell him to wait. She said because there's a joy about the wedding night that cannot be described in words. There's a joy about the wedding night because, like I said last Sunday, after you've emptied the honey of the money of honey, what are you wedding night? There's no honey. There's no thrill. Because the moon is empty. The moon is bankrupt. Look at somebody and say, wait! Genesis 34 is a long passage. But let me just pick significant passages for you. Pass here for you. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. This was the daughter, the only daughter of, of, uh, of Jacob. So they, as they, in their journey, they came to this city, and while they were waiting there, she went out to see the daughters of the land. She wanted to hang out with the other girls. Look at verse three, verse two. He said, "When Sesham, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the priest of the country, saw her, he took her and he laid with her, and he violated her. If a man sleeps with you before the wedding day, he has violated you. Violated you." Verse three. He says, after he slept with her, his soul was strongly attracted to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So he went to his father and said, give me this young woman as a wife. So when Jacob heard that he had, he had defiled his daughter, his sons and his livestock, everybody was angry. 
Look at verse 7. And the sons of Jacob came to came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter before the wedding. And Amos spoke with them, saying, Oh, the soul of my son Sashem long for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give us your daughter. Now look at this passage. Go back. I don't have the time now. This man wanted to marry the girl. He really loved her. He wanted to marry her. But he had slept with her before the marriage. And this was an abomination. So Jacob was angry. His children were angry. Everybody was angry in the camp of the Israelites. That is how we are. We are chosen people of God. We are chosen people of God. We do not live like the world. There's a standard for us as believers. We don't live like the world. Let's see that passage. It says, my goodness. By the time you read the whole passage, the Bible says, look at, look at, okay, let's look at. The, the sons of Jacob now arranged and they killed all the men in that city. Now, some of you may say that was cruel, it was brutal, but there was a trick they were playing. Because Hammer went and told the people, you know what? Since they want us to circumcise, let's just circumcise. He said, but you know what? When we get circumcised, we're going to take all their cattle. We're going to take all their livestock. They were playing that trick on them. But these guys were smarter. Look at it, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am now, I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed my household of high. Jacob was rebuking his children that why did you do this? Let's read the next verse together and see what the children see. Everybody. What did he do to the sister? That was all he did. He, all he did was he slept with her and said, I will marry you anyway. And Jacob, the children said, no. When you do that, you are behaving like a harlot. Hey, I know these are strong words on the Sunday morning. But when you sleep with the guy before the marriage, you're behaving like a hammer. Now the question is this. So what do we do? Somebody, where's Jennifer? She asked a question last Sunday. Where's Jennifer? Okay. She asked a very interesting question. She said, okay. But we have gone to the court. We want to get married. We've decided, yeah, this is it. This, this is the rule. This is what, not the rule. This is what I would advise. If you want to do, because some people say, well, we don't want to do, um, oh, let me back up the question. Some people say, we did traditional wedding. Is traditional wedding okay? Yes, it's okay if that's where you intend to stop. But get engage the church leaders in that particular procedure you are doing. Am I making sense to you? Are you listening? If you want to stop there, or if all you want to do, you want to stop, or just we want to just go to court and do it and stop there. Engage the church leaders too. If you are in a local church, engage the church leaders and say, hey, we're going to get married in the court, but please come and pray over us and bless us because by this we are getting married. So when the church does that, they recognize your marriage and they give it spiritual validity. Does that make sense to you? One last question. What about masturbation? Remember, I started by telling you that a woman is very critical in the life of a man. If a man could masturbate and be happy, God would not have given him a woman. And when God created a woman, he created a woman for relationship. That was why by the time he created Eve, Adam was already there. He had a good house. He had a good job. His business was thriving. The, the garden was doing well. And so the woman came and just to come and enjoy So when the woman arrived, the man was already there. That is why a man derives satisfaction from his job and a woman derives satisfaction from her family. My husband, my children, when two women 
Jemima and Josephine, they meet in the mall. They, they, don't, they don't ask themselves, oh, how is your job? Have you been promoted? Have you been given a raise? No. Those two women say, oh, how is your child? Hey, how is the journey? Hey, how is the finish school? That's all they talk about. Oh, my little baby. Oh. And some of them call their baby mama. Mama, 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 mama. God bless you. I mean, that's what you choose to call your baby. Mama. Yeah. That's what women talk about. But when men meet, what do we talk about? We talk about our jobs. Oh boy, I don't like that, that, my, my, that my boss. I need to get a raise. I must be promoted. That's what men talk about. Because a man was created, when he was created, he was given a job. When a woman was created, he, she was given what? Women live for relationships. Men find fulfillment in their job. That's why if you are married to a man who does not have a job, don't help to deflate his ego. Because the man will be getting angry and depressed and you know, and you wouldn't know why. It's because he, the thing that massages and surges his ego has been taken away. Am I making sense this morning? Do you think I'm teaching I'm teaching well? You know, I know, I know I've, you know, it's been a mixed combo, but hey, sometimes that's what you get. You know? You come to church, sometimes the pastor is on fire, he gives you. You know, when I was younger, you remember those days I used to jump from there. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. <laughs> hey, now I come down gently. <laughs> I want to, I want to get to my destination. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know we're taking some time this morning. But if you don't mind, I mean if you have any question you want to ask, I'll give you another two minutes. Let me answer this question so that we because you still want to ask questions. say that today, if you had questions, you should have tweeted it or sent it by email or something. But if you don't mind, let's just take one or two questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, we we already praise the Lord. Just ask the question. <laughs> First, over the week, actually, we had a lot of arguments concerning this question. Yes. My first question is, uh, as regards to the statement you made last week about uh, if you are in a relationship with someone all until yeah and marriage is for better for worse right you cannot sure. divorce you just marriage. ask the question all right now as a doctor i've seen ladies without no lady private part yeah, you've seen their nakedness yeah. yes yeah no no not their nakedness they don't have it they don't have the... okay and, go ahead. and as for guys do we have issues where they have issues with having erections and stuff like that mm -hmm. When you get married and you find out that situation, what do you do? Good question. You're stuck. Good question. Good question. Thank you. Just stop there. That question, that one. Perhaps I should leave that question for next week. I think I should answer that question next week. Yeah. I'll answer that one next week. The movie continues. <laughs> <laughs> that, that question no 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 because it's a loaded question Let, listen I, I, I went to an office I went to an office where I met a lady I used to go to that office my friend was working in that office and I used to go to the office a lot and every time I saw this lady she was always moody depressed sudden I, I had no clue so one day I engaged her in a conversation and I discovered that she had been married and that she told me this very sad story that she was going to get married and she married a man who never had an erection and the, part, the sad part of the story was that the pastor who weathered them knew. And she married the man. So she was so depressed, so bitter, so angry. And one day she told the pastor that may you not marry a... May your daughter... Because the man had, I think, two girls. He said, may God help you, your daughter, not to find a man like I did. So, are the question. So, but next week, the movie continues. Yes. Yes, sir. Huh? Ask your second question. Just ask it. I will. I will. Yeah. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
you're tired for whatever reason, you can divorce. Mm -hmm. Now, does God recognize that? No, no, too? no, that's not God's intention. God says when you marry for better or for worse, except if the spouse dies. Or if you marry a man who is not a Christian, if you were married and the guy was not a Christian, and then the guy now, uh, the guy now decides to leave you, that you are free. That's what the Bible says. I could give you the second condition in cases of crass infidelity. The Bible says that in case of infidelity, you know, a man can think otherwise. We don't have time for all that. One last question from the back. Was there a question? If there's none, I think it's a good place to stop today. Don't you think so? I think. Jennifer, you want to ask another question again? Which one again? Oh, there's a guy there who wants to ask a question. Please. Let's listen to that guy. Our services are not normally this long. Oh. Again, because this year, that's part of my own. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. If you marry the girl and you have sex mm -hmm. and you didn't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> hold on. What hold should on. I do? Hold on. Praise the Lord. The question is, which one don't this you like? After the wedding, no. Which one don't you like? Is it the girl or the sex? Which of them? This. Can I we mean, listen? Can we listen? Like yes, sir. Don't listen to them. Talk to me. Why are you disturbing the guy now? What's your question? Um, I didn't like what I saw in there. That's all. Okay. No, listen, listen, listen. I know this is not a class for married people because there are teenagers here and all that. But listen, this is it. Oh, they need to learn. Okay, thank you. This is it. Listen, listen. Please, I hope everybody's listening. Listen. When you marry, if you marry and you say, well, you did not enjoy the, the, the sexual relationship. Uncle, you ask the question and you're talking. Listen to me now. Uh -uh. When you marry and you say you did not enjoy the sexual relationship, it depends. There are either of two possibilities. It's either you've been doing it so many times. Now, no, no, no. Now, you've been doing it so many times and then now this new person, you are not enjoying it with this new person. That's one possibility. Or, the other possibility is that you this other person is not doing it the way you have been doing it with the many other people. Those are two possibilities. Now, this is what I will tell you. If you have been doing it before and this new person does not do it the way you've been doing it, teach the person. Take time. No, take time. Take time. Teach the person. Teach the person. Teach the person. Until okay, the person does it. Okay? So don't say, hey, I don't like it. I'm going, no. Stay, stay, stay. And let the people of God say, yeah. I think this, I'll just be preaching on this topic every Sunday. <laughs> you, know? you know, teach the person. Alternatively, and this is what I will tell you, because, you see, and this is the reality of life. This is the reality of life. People come to marriages from different backgrounds. They come to marriages from different backgrounds. This is what I tell you. And that's why if you look at that first Corinthians chapter 7, it keeps using the word a virgin. A virgin. A virgin. Because in Bible, the Bible days, the woman was supposed to be married as an anatomical virgin. An anatomical virgin. But this is it. Some people now are not anatomical virgin. But if any man be in Christ, he is what? New creature. So every girl who is a believer is a virgin. Because some guy says, I'm looking for a virgin. You are not a virgin. And you are looking for a virgin. What nonsense is that? Every believer is a... If a woman is in Christ, she's a virgin. So what you do is when you're coming to marriage, if you're coming with a different baggage, what you do is you ask the Lord to really help you sanitize. <laughs> Tell the Lord to help you sweep, sweep your heart, sweep your mind, sweep your memory, sweep it clean, sweep it clean, and come to marriage. Do you get that? So that you can now begin to, you know, begin, you can now, because it's a, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. And don't forget that the Bible says that we are the bride to Jesus Christ. You know? Just ask it. Thank 
a pregnant woman ordain. not ordain um, acknowledge in church marry a pregnant woman it's not a redeemed policy it's a biblical policy okay but the my my other problem is you can bless the union because this, there's nothing you can do about it what if you if you if you can marry um women who are virgins so why wouldn't you marry thing to show for it, that they aren't that they aren't you know that they aren't virgins because they have a child and God is the only one who gives children so why do you use it against them you know in sense that oh because you have a child to show for it because you had sex before marriage no no no, 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 no. there are two different things you're saying it's you a have a child but you're pregnant there are two different things pregnant because they won't if you have a if you have a child mm -hmm. would redeem acknowledge and marry you no there are two different things if they have you know what? You ask me the question next week when I come, I will amplify it and then we'll answer it. So that we don't waste that much time on this, okay? okay? Yeah. You ask me the question later, I will okay. amplify it and, and then. Jennifer, I'll give you a chance. Is that the question? You said something about um, when the gentleman asked the question mm -hmm. about um, when you're answering, you said um, that if the, if the man is not a believer, mm -hmm. then on that, on that note, they can divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But is it not the same Bible that says that? sake of a believing woman, your husband is saved. So I want to think that if you get into marriage with an unbeliever, mm -hmm. and you I mean, and you do all your spiritual rites, mm -hmm. pray, praying and all that, mm -hmm. the man is automatically, spiritually covered. Say, let, me, let me explain. So it, I did not say you can divorce him because he's not a believer. But I said that if he chooses to leave, that you're free. Is there, go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, and that if the woman chooses to leave because she's not a Christian either, that the man is also free. That's what the Bible says. You see, some of these things, when, if we go back, because what I do is, when I finish teaching like this, last Sunday, when I went back home, I sat down with First Corinthians chapter 7 and I studied it all over again. The reason being that I want to know it for myself. Whether I'm a pastor, I'm not a pastor, I need to know what to do. So each of you should go back, pick the Bible, First Corinthians chapter 7, and answer Auntie, what question do you want to ask now? Oh, God have mercy. There are too many. Okay, this will be the last one. I'll take... Uh, I don't know you. Oh, I know you, but I've forgotten your name. My name is Kinkai. Uh, Kinkai. Okay. I have Kinkai. two questions. Um, okay. You were saying that um, um, when a man um, does not have money, and um, he's, you, you take out his... Um, Frustration his, on the woman. Yeah, on the, on the woman. Do you tolerate a man that doesn't have money? Or do you do you tolerate a man that doesn't have money? He's not willing to go out to work, or do you tell him to go out, or do you force him to go out to work? As in, then, the second, second then the second question is, what do you do with uh, women that have been married for so long and the husbands don't touch them? Like maybe they've been in the house for like four or five years and the husbands are not touching them. Bring what the man to me. I will lay hands on him. <laughs> no. no that, what if the man would not come to you? No, I will come to the house. No, no, sit down. Don't, don't, don't answer this very please. No, 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 no. You know what? What you do is you, you want to pray. Because the whole concept of marriage, in fact, in that case, listen, I, I don't want to go legal now. I, you know, I'm a consult with some attorneys and get, because marriage, marriage, the, the basis for a complete marriage is consummation. When a marriage cannot be consumed, the marriage is, is null and void. When a marriage cannot be consumed, it's null and void. So, legally and to the best of my understanding, biblically, because I think it's criminal. Okay, if somebody said the guy is a he, she, you know, so we don't know. No, but we don't know. We don't know. No, no, we don't know. No, we don't know. Now, but the other aspect is should a man be without a job and not look for a job? It is not biblical for a man to be without a job and not look for a job. A man who does not have a job should look for a do any job, do any anything you want to do. Just do anything. Do something. If you want to be cleaning your house and getting your wife to pay you, clean the house. Let her pay you. Okay? So it's not because I don't want men there to say, oh, yeah, you're, you're the pastor. Pastor said that when I don't have a job, I get angry, I get frustrated, and I take it out on you. I didn't say that. Too. I didn't say that. I'm saying that don't get angry, don't get frustrated, look for a job. And give your wife good money. Give her money and tell her 
Go and spend the card, man. Just, just bring the receipts to me. Just let me keep track of the expenses. 